Hello, everyone. Welcome to Improving Talks. Uh, we will get started at 12.02 Central, just to give everyone a few moments to join in. Hold on. We'll be starting soon. Welcome again, everyone. Just one minute, we'll get started with this presentation from Improving Talks. All righty. Welcome to Improving Talks, your Wednesday session to learn and grow. Before we get started, I would like to point everyone down to the bottom center of your screen. You should see a Q&A button. Please ask your questions there. We'll be taking questions throughout the talk. So ask it as soon as you have it, and we'll find a good time to go ahead and answer it. I would like to introduce Jordan Wagner. He is a senior software engineer at Improving Houston Enterprise. His fascination with computers and programming began in the eighth grade when his family acquired their first computer. He pursued computer science in college in New York, where he secured an internship as an application developer. Since then, he has continued his career in software. Around five years ago, Jordan relocated to Houston. During his leisure time, he enjoys working on side projects and is a co-founder of a local community named Side Project Society. This community convenes monthly, providing plat a platform for individuals engaged in side projects and seeking startup knowledge to network and learn. They host speakers, including founders and subject matter experts to share their experiences and insights with the group. Beyond his professional life, Jordan finds joy in traveling, taking his dogs to the park, who doesn't, scuba diving and playing tennis. He's passionate about connecting with others. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out with him. And now take it away, Jordan. All right. Thank you so much, Bud. I really appreciate the introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It's a little funny that um, this is actually my first Improving Talks. Usually, I'm the producer, and I'm doing what Bud is doing, introducing the speakers. It's a little weird to be on the other side of the camera, finally. Um, but I am excited. I have some cool stuff for you guys today, and I appreciate you all joining us. Uh, kind of what Bud said, and just to recap a little bit, uh, I'm Jordan. I'm a senior software engineer here at Improving. Uh, I've been with the company for just over two years now. Um, and I host the Community Side Project Society here in Houston. It's in person. I'm going to get to it a little bit, but if you're in Houston, definitely check it out if you love side projects. I'm sure a lot of the people on this call are actually been to the meeting before. Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn, so if you want to reach out to me at any point, usually I respond. You can either scan this QR code or punch that uh, URL into your browser. Um, just shoot me a message, connect, and see what's up. Yeah. Uh, to view this presentation later, uh, you can punch this URL in or scan this QR code. It'll actually just bring you to Google Drive, and uh, you can see all my speaker notes are in the notes section of the presentation. So if you want to just kind of go over what, I, what I've what i talked about, uh, you can definitely do that. Um, also, the uh, presentation this is recorded, so it'll be on our YouTube channel later. Um, I believe I added links to that somewhere, uh, but you can either go to improving.com 
slash webinars and see them all there. Uh, and you can see what's coming up and you can see all the recording for our past presentation. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Side Project Society. Um, that's kind of what I've been known here for in Houston. I'm one of the co-founders, one of three. Uh, it's a great, great community here in Houston. Um, if you are working on side projects, you are interested in side projects, you want to just learn what other people are working on, you want to maybe learn about startups and entrepreneurship, uh, it's a great place to go. Uh, we meet once a month. It's totally free. It's a ton of networking, a ton of talking to other like-minded people. And we bring in speakers that are either co-founders, kind of what Bo was saying, they're founders, CEOs, subject matter experts, and they share their story, they share their knowledge, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It gets real sometimes. So it's a very cool community. We bring in about 40 people each meeting. Um, just kind of keep on going. Uh, this conversation is going to be very casual. Um, so at any point, if you have any questions, just feel free to punch them in the chat and I'll try to address them. I want this to be very uh, back and forth kind of conversation. And I'm talking about something and it's not really applying to your projects or if you want to see how it could apply to your project, punch those in. I'll try to see what I can, what kind of advice I can get. Um, so I have a problem and I'm hoping maybe someone on here has a solution. Maybe, I know you came to me with questions, but I'm coming to you with a question. Uh, I have tons of ideas. I'm a software engineer, uh, so I love working on projects. I have the ability to work on most projects uh, and the ability to build a lot of things out, but I don't have the time to do everything. So my question for you is, how do you guys manage like time, uh, working on side projects, uh, building things that you're interested in building? Like right now I'm working on a project that's taken me probably six or seven months to get to where I'm at right now. It's just one project. I have all these other ideas that I want to work on that I think are really cool. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Feel free to post them in the comments section if you have any any uh, techniques or time, uh, any how you kind of dedicate time to certain things, if you fall into that category. Anyway, let's get into the presentation. Um, I'm going to just kind of put some context on everyone's plate, just kind of give you a little bit of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to be going through a lot of different principles and a lot of different ideas and a lot of different concepts throughout the presentation. I'm going to refer to two example projects. Um, one is a very technical project uh, that I built myself, um, and one is a physical project. Actually, one of the community members in Cyber Project Society uh, created, and it's been very successful for them. So. My technical project is called Dive Sharp, and give you a little bit of information what that is. It's a mobile app for scuba divers. When I moved to Houston, one of my friends was a scuba diver and absolutely fascinating. All the pictures they showed me thought it was really cool. And I was like, this is amazing. You're just surrounded by thousands of fish underwater. I'm like, how do I do that? So she got me into scuba diving. And when you scuba dive, one of the things you have to do is log all the information, like log your equipment that you use, the weather conditions, how far down you went, how long it took, all this information. And so when they teach you, they have you do it on paper. And there's already apps for this uh, to log stuff on your phone. But I, I decided once I was done with my training, I wanted to build my own app. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into what that looks like later, but that's one of the example projects. The other is uh, this woman, Ina, in Side Project Society. She's actually one of our speakers and talked about her her startup. Um, it's when she moved to the United States, she had a problem that she faced, right? And she felt very unhealthy. She felt like the food she was eating here wasn't like it was at home. And she just wanted something to uh, to make her feel a little bit healthier here when she was in Houston. Um, and so she created a protein bar. Uh, and it was it solved a problem that she had. It was created with fresh, healthy ingredients. Um, it was a physical product. And it was something that she could, you know, sell. She ended up selling it and she makes a lot of money off of this, this product. It's very, very interesting concept. So again, like a lot of the principles I'm going to be talking about uh, apply to both. Um, so 
keep those two in mind as I go through the presentation. Um, and so let me go to the next slide. Validation. Validation is a really big part of any side project, any idea. Now, I'm going to start with a small disclaimer. If you are working on a side project that's just for you, if you're small, solving a small problem just for yourself and you don't want to launch it, you may be able to skip the validation phase. But in most cases, if you want other users to use whatever it is that you're building or you're creating, uh, maybe one day far in the future, if you get lucky enough, you can have a successful startup out of it. Validation is a really important thing to think about. Um, and when you have your idea for whatever it is that you want to build, the first thing you need to think about is validation. Um, and so what is validation? Kind of from the word itself, you can figure it out, but it's basically you have this idea and you need to figure out if it's worth building this idea. Um, you're going to put a lot of time, energy, effort, and probably money into this, this project. Um, is it really worth spending all of that on it, on this one idea, right? And some things you can find from your validation phase is maybe if you pivot ever so slightly or you look at it at a different angle, um, you might have the ability to make it a much more potentially successful project uh, with many more users because now you're incorporating other things you didn't consider that you discovered during your validation phase. Um, and so... Again, if you don't really do this right, or you try to skip this step, you can waste a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of resources kind of building this project out if you were to just figure out if it was worth building or or do that validation first. Um, and you no, know, when you, even for me, you know, I'm a software engineer, I can build my own technical projects. I, I like to build a lot of mobile apps right now. It's kind of been my recent interest. Um, and, even for me, you know, I build it myself, but it still costs me money, you know, to buy the logos, to get servers up and running. If you're not technical and you need to hire a team, or if you're building even like, like again, the protein bar, if you're building or creating a protein bar, you still need to buy the materials, the machinery, the, the food supplies and stuff like that. So you make a lot of assumptions on what you might like versus what other people might like that this validation phase is going to helpfully clear up if you do it right. Um, and it's really important you don't skip it. So for example, um, no matter what it is, you might uh, it might cost a little money to do the validation, um, but it'd be cost, it might cost you way less than if you didn't, right? So if you ended up pursuing some idea and it ended up not going anywhere uh, or not being exactly what it could have been, then you could have spent a lot more in that process than if you were to do the validation phase. Anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about my scuba diving app, Dive Shark, right? So that project, it's really funny. Uh, I worked on it before I really learned about all this kind of stuff. And it took me over a year to build, probably close to 14 months to build the whole application. Um, I had this idea. And part of it was I wanted to learn some new technologies. You know, I wanted to learn how to make mobile apps. I wanted to learn about Docker and Kubernetes and scalable systems and stuff like that, kind of outside the scope of this, this presentation. But I also wanted to build a mobile app that other people would use and enjoy. Um, so I finally, I built this app. I just went heads down. I didn't talk to anyone about it. Uh, it took me 14 months to really get it out the door. By the end of it, I was so burnt out. I was so tired. <laughs> and I finally finished everything. And um, I built it in a way that was very scalable. And in that case, it actually cost me a lot of money to set up those systems. And I was building it so it could support thousands of users and it wasn't even out the door yet, right? Um, there was a lot of bugs in this version that I released and launched with. Um, and I was so tired after launching that I actually ended up shutting it down a few weeks later. Um, and I bring all this up because really it was a lot of lessons learned. I walked away from this project um, with a lot more insight and experience that I now will apply to my current projects um, that saved me a lot of time. For example, in my most recent project, I was able to get out the door in four months and get it to market. And I got a lot of users and I wasn't burnt out by the end of it. So 
Uh, and kind of like I mentioned, you know, I use DiveSharp as a platform for me to learn a bunch of new concepts and technologies, which is great, but it would have been so much better. I could have learned those concepts and technologies on a project that was successful, right? Uh, that it didn't shut down. When I launched Dive, uh, sorry, when I launched Dive Sharp, it got a good amount of attention. I posted it on Facebook, I posted it on Reddit, and the people downloaded it and they installed it and they were using it a little bit. But just because there were so many bugs and it wasn't stable, and I was just like so done with the project, I couldn't handle supporting it anymore. And that's kind of why it ended up shutting down two or three weeks later. Uh, so a few of the lessons I kind of learned while I was working on this project is don't just build something, right? Or right? don't, you have an idea, don't just go and build it, right? There's a lot to think about when it's that idea. Can you pivot a little bit? Is it really the best idea or can you come off of something that's slightly different that might be a lot better? Um, and maybe it incorporates a bigger market or there's more of a need for that problem to be solved, whatever it is, right? Um, the next thing I walked away with was don't gold plate an MVP. When I built Dive Sharp, I gold plated. I put every single feature I really wanted into the initial release. Uh, and a lot of these concepts, you know, they might sound uh, like obvious to a lot of people on here, but to me at that time, it wasn't obvious, right? I'm going to come back to this specific point later. Don't gold plate your MVP. There are certain situations that might actually be different. So remember this point, we'll come back to a little bit later. Um, another thing I thought about, or I walked away with is getting to market as fast as possible, right? Uh, you're going to be building this product and you're gonna need feedback and you're gonna need, know, need to know what to build, and how to build it and what your users want versus what you want. Um, and if you don't get it to market, and you just make all these assumptions, finally, when you get to market, it's you have this huge thing that people might not necessarily need. And maybe if you pivoted just a little bit, it would be uh, more applicable to them, right? So getting to market as fast as possible with a uh, very um, lean product means that you can get feedback from users and they'll tell you what they want, right? They know that your product is gonna be new. And they're going to be understanding about that, right? And if it's this giant project that's very confusing to them, it doesn't do what they were thinking, then they're more likely to believe than if it was very thin project where they thought, hey, maybe I can reach out to the, the developer or the creator of this and make some suggestions, right? So you want to get to market as fast as possible for a bunch of reasons. Uh, next thing I walked away with was um wasted time building features like so i built a lot of features in dive sharp that just wasted a ton of time right like one of them for example is social media when you scuba dive and you log your dive you're supposed to write who you dove with right uh who who's with you i was a buddy was a friend was it a stranger whatever it is you're supposed to write down their information um and so when i built my my app i made it so you can add your dive buddies to your log and you know that required creating accounts and like adding people to your friends list and how do you connect with those people when your hands are wet and you're just getting out of a lake and is it going to be a qr code and what if that person is weird and you want to block them later so it actually opened the door for all these crazy things i didn't think of initially you know i i ended up spending a long time on this feature this one feature probably over a month right and if I got rid of that in my MVP, I mean that means I could have gone to market a lot faster. And this feature actually had some bugs, so it didn't work right. And that would have been stuff I wouldn't have to worry about when I launched, right? Let my users request that feature. Hey, you know, it would be great if I can connect with my dive buddies and add them to my log. All right, let's start seeing what that looks like for you instead of for me and and build that for their needs, right? So that's kind of um, some of the lessons I walked away from with Dive Shark. So this, this slide says validation, but how do you actually validate something? What does that look like on paper, right? Uh, if you have your idea and you want to see if it's a viable idea, if it's worth building, worth spending the time, maybe hiring a team to, to help you build it, uh, we got to figure out what that validation phase is. 
actually looks like, right? So uh, what you're answering in this phase is, do your users actually want to use your product, right? Uh, if you built it, if you had it today, will people use it? Uh, and that's what you're trying to answer in this, this phase without spending that time, that energy, and those resources. Now you can go in and ask your family, uh, you can even ask your friends and they'll probably say, yeah, this would be a cool product. I would, I would use this, but you only have so many of those people in your life and they're just going to be nice and they're not going to want to hurt your feelings. And they're going to probably say yes, even though they would never use it. Right. And you ask your mom, my mom would love to use my diving app, but she's not a scuba diver. Right. And it doesn't make any sense. But when you go to market, you have to convince random strangers across the world to use your product to leave whatever it is that they're doing they might be scrolling twitter and they come across an ad for your application or for your protein bar and they have to leave uh twitter where they're hanging out and talking with their friends and joking around to go install an application uh and then open it and start using it uh or to go to a website and purchase this protein bar so those are the people that really you need to focus on um when you do your validation it might be good to talk to some friends and family uh but you're also going to want to talk to some strangers and see if if this is something that they would actually be willing to use and we'll get a little bit into how to find those people how to talk to them but that's just something to keep in mind another thing to think about when you're validating your idea is is this problem already being solved is there competitors in your market right um and it doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't build it if there are competitors and get a little bit into that um but if you're entering a market that's very niche and there's not any other competitors in it that's fantastic that's amazing but those ideas are a lot harder to come up with right not everyone is going to have those ideas and and so most likely uh if you're trying to build something there's already going to be people in that space so that's just another thing to think about is there are there very established competitors in that market like if you're going to build a next search engine right there's already google and there's already Bing, there's already DuckDuckGo, and there's all these other solutions that work amazing how are you ever going to compete with them versus maybe for the protein bar one of the reasons i think it was successful is for ena there was a lot of other protein bars in that market and it happens to be a market that people tend to like to try different protein bars. You know, if you're trying to lose weight or uh, body build or be healthier, um, you're willing to look at the different protein bars when you're in the grocery store. You know, there are big players like Flip and some others, but people tend to kind of explore and look at the other ones. So that's a market that's a little more flexible. Whereas if you're going to a very established market, it's going to be more difficult. Um, And how do you the whole thing when you're launching your product is you're going to have to convince people to use it when you have no reputation, right? So again, if I'm scrolling Twitter and I come across an ad for Dive Sharp, that's just some random website that's going to want my login information. That seems like a lot of work and it's sketchy. I don't know if I'm going to do it, right? But that's what you have to do when you go to market. You have to convince people to leave whatever it is that they're doing to use your product when you have no reputation. Once you get more established, it might be easier. People might suggest your product. They might see it a few times and then be more familiar with it. But when you go to market, really, that's a big hurdle you're going to have to go over. So that's that's really what you need to figure out is if this product is worth building um, and are you going to be able to get over those obstacles? Um, so I kind of mentioned earlier, like if you're entering a market with already very established um, competitors in the space, I'm going to use Google versus Bing, for example. Uh, for me, I use my search engine as Google. And I think a lot of people probably use Google over Bing. But and the reason for that, I think, is Google was so well established, already had uh, very fast results returned, um, returned results very fast very good results, Did had every single website on it that that mattered, right? And so when Bing came across, it came into the market, um, they launched fully featured uh, with no bugs and they launched 
with a very good product that had very good search results. Let's say Bing came to market with search results that were turned a thousand times faster than Google, right? Well, to me, it doesn't matter. Google already returns your results instantly, right? If it's one tenth of a second versus a one thousandth of a second, I can't tell the difference. So what does it matter if it's actually faster? That feature doesn't doesn't mean anything to me as a user. Um, what does it matter if Bing returns uh, chicken parmesan recipes from one form when Google returns it from another? It's still the same recipe to me, at least. I just need to know how what temperature to cook my chicken at, right? So when Bing came to market, they were facing a bigger problem. And when you have your idea and you're thinking about your idea and who's already in that space, these are things to think about. Another example I could use right now is Twitter versus Threads. Um, Twitter had a very questionable um, leadership at some points, right? They made some very questionable decisions on how Twitter is going to work. And a lot of users were upset with how some of the changes that came into play. And a lot of, a lot of users wanted to leave. Instagram launched the red and it worked. I thought, at least I thought it worked very well. Um, a lot of people went out over to it and actually started using it right away. Um, but I don't think it took off. I mean, I might be wrong, but I'm still using Twitter and everyone I know is still using Twitter. And it's interesting to think about that because people were so upset with some of the stuff that was happening on Twitter, but they didn't want to leave, right? It seems weird. When you think about it, think about the amount of years and years that people spent creating content on Twitter, the amount of time investment they spent posting tweets, thousands and thousands of tweets, um, and all the friends they created on and they met on Twitter and all the jokes they've had and the laughs that they had, doesn't none of that exists on threads. They invested their time and energy into Twitter for so long and so much of it that they decided it was just easier to deal with the, the difficulties of Twitter than leaving that platform. So when you go to market with the new Facebook or the new Twitter or whatever it is, you can't just launch with an MVP, right? This is kind of the point I'm saying, remember, earl, uh, to think about earlier, and we'll come back to is don't gold plate your MVP. In this case, if you were go to market like Threads or Bing, you have to actually gold plate. You don't have an option. Because if you do anything that's less than 10 times better than the existing product, there's no chance people are going to leave that platform for yours. In most cases, I think anyone on this call or watching this video recording later isn't going to have one of those things. And if you do, I really suggest to think about it for a very long time. Uh, you're probably not going to have that problem. So if you're entering a space with uh, not so established competitors, then you're going to be a much better place. Um, and again, like if you're entering a space with less competitors, of course, those ideas are harder to come up with, but they're definitely more feasible, I think, in the long run. Um, and so validation is more than just talking to users, right? A big part of validating your idea is talking to users, but it's deciding if this idea is really worth building. So a bunch of these things I just talked about are things you have to think about before you start writing any code, before you start buying any ingredients. Think about all of this, right? And do you fall in that category of very difficult, maybe okay, or probably okay? Um, and so we kind of get into, the next thing I wanna talk about is building something you are familiar with, right? Or maybe you're solving a problem that you have. Uh, those are always good, right? You know, when she created her protein bar, she was solving a problem that she had. I don't know if she cooked before she did her protein bar or made anything like that before, but she was willing to learn and get over those obstacles because she really, really wanted to solve this problem that she had. Um, so she was familiar with the space uh, and it was a problem that she had that made this whole project much easier for her. Uh, for Dive Sharp, Again, that was a very familiar space for me. You know, I was a scuba diver and I wanted to build some app for scuba diving. There's a, still a lot of things I was had to learn about scuba diving in order to build this app, but I was able to learn those things much easier and uh, and understand them much easier than if I was not a scuba diver trying to build this app. 
right? So those are some things to think about with your idea. Is it, is it something you're familiar with? Because if it's not, it's going to be so much more difficult to, to build, right? So like, let's say, for example, a friend of mine came to me and said, hey, Jordan, I have this idea for this application. I think you'd be a great person to build it out. That idea might sound really cool to me, but I'm not familiar with that space, right? And so that's a decision I got to make. Am I willing to put in that extra effort to learn that space and become familiar with it to build this product, right? I have to understand my users and understand their wants and their needs and why they have those wants and those needs. Otherwise, I'm going to build a product incorrectly and they're not going to want to use it because it doesn't do what they need for whatever problem they have. It gets even harder if you're in that unfamiliar space and you don't have an interest in learning it, right? So you have your friend comes to you with something that seems interesting or something that doesn't even seem interesting. Now you're at a fork in the road, like, right? It's going to be even more difficult for me to understand this project. Um, I don't really, not really interested in it. Should I still pursue it? The answer is, it really depends on who you are and what your interests are. So for me, I have worked on projects that don't really interest me and they come out really good because I'm more interested in problem solving, understanding the space, understanding the users and and that whole concept of it. I really like building software and problem solving that way. So for me, I'm okay entering that space. Whereas I have people who, and friends that wouldn't work out for them, right? Because uh, as soon as they become come across a problem they have to solve, they're not interested in it anymore. Um, they're not motivated to solve that problem because it's too difficult and it's something they don't really care about. So it kind of depends who you are, and if you're willing to kind of overcome those issues. Again, these are concepts you have to think about and and figure out if it's really something you can handle. So getting back to how you actually do your validation, that was concepts you have to think about, but now you have to take steps, to do the actual validation, right? What does that look like on paper? Um, the biggest thing is you want to talk to potential users, right? Uh, something I recommend is called the Empathy Map Canvas. There's another one called uh, the uh, Business Model Canvas. They're both really good and you should both do both of those in the validation phase. I'm not gonna get too much into the details of them. But you can watch great YouTube videos. You can watch or uh, read a ton of articles on them. There's books for them and everything like that. I definitely recommend uh, looking into those before you start building your MVP, building your MVP. But um, anyway, first step to actually doing your validation, I think is to talking to your users, right? You're gonna really wanna find if people are having this problem. If you can't find anyone that has this problem or use your product, then it's a big indicator that maybe you shouldn't build it, right? So for me, I'm gonna go back to the scuba diving app, right? When, if I were to do the validation for that project, um, what that might look like is me sitting down with someone who is a scuba diver that I probably don't know too well. Um, and it all kind of depends on who you have access to, but that would be ideal. Uh, and just talking to them. And you got to do this in a very specific way where you don't introduce any, any bias to them, right? You don't want to just tell them about your product and, hey, would you use this? Because they'll probably say yes. What you got to do is talk to them about how they scuba dive, go through the whole process, and... And then somewhere in that whole conversation, squeeze your idea in there and without telling them and see how they would face that problem and how they solve it. And if they even have that problem right now, right? Those are questions you have to answer. So for example, I might be sitting down talking to someone that's a scuba diver and be like, so, hey, how, how often you're a scuba diver, right? And they say, yes, right? We talk a little bit how they got into it. So how do you... Uh, decide when to scuba dive. Do you just scuba dive a lot or very rarely? And then, yeah, I scuba dive once a month, maybe. I ask them how they find out about their scuba diving excursions. They go with groups or friends. They find about find out about them on Facebook. Oh, yeah, I know people who post on Facebook and there's a group I'm in. And that's already an indicator. You, know, you might have not already thought about, oh, they're on Facebook groups. That's something to remember. Maybe you can incorporate that somehow into your project. Right. Oh, yeah, I find these posts on Facebook and then um, I'll 
go out comments, see who's going, see what time of day, stuff like that. Uh, they talk about how they meet up with the people, if they carpool, um, where they go, right? And then you get into like once they're there, you ask them like, well, okay, you now you've arrived at Blue Lagoon in Huntsville, Texas, right? You're gonna go in the water. Uh, okay, talk to them a little bit about what that looks like and tell you, oh yeah, we have to come up with a dive plan. I don't really know these people. So we need to have a strategy in place if something goes wrong, um, how long and where we're gonna go and stuff like that. Um, if someone gets lost, what's the plan, right? Do we go to the surface? Are there a lot of boats, things like that? And then, you know, they finally, all right, yeah, once we're done, we get out of the water, we'll go grab lunch and then we go home. And they just skipped right over the whole log portion of your, your, right? I was solving a problem for people to log their scoop, with di their, their dives. So I kind of have to like figure out how to backtrack. Well, tell me a little bit more. Like once you get out of the water, you just take off your equipment and go, do you have to do anything? And you try to kind of poke at the problem more and more until they start revealing that, oh, yeah, actually, um, right now I'm using this app that uh, let me lock my my dies. Oh, interesting. Now you know they already have a, problem, a solution. Maybe they mentioned they have a diving watch that connects to some system somewhere that when they go home, they can just pull it up that way, right? And I say, well, is there any like problems with the, the watch? Is it do anything that you're you wanted to do well yeah actually i have to write some information down and then i merge it all into an excel sheet perfect now i know that they have a problem with their current solution that they're solving manually through excel right now if that's not something they mentioned they brought up that's a key indicator that they don't have this problem maybe it's not worth building so you can kind of dig at this a little bit more and more without telling them what your idea is without introducing any bias um and I'm going to show some resources later that go into this even more and talk about how you should talk to your users. Um, but that's kind of some of the key concepts, right? Now, once you've finished your interview with the person, you can go back and say, hey, okay, well, now that we're done, I have my notes. I can show you my mock-ups. I can introduce you to uh, what my application is going to be, what I, it is that I'm building. And, they'll, uh, and you can share that information with them, right? So now that you've finished that interview, that's kind of when you can start introducing and dig, get some more information from them. Um, I recommend, probably don't wanna to talk to too many users, right? Uh, if you're talking to 50 people, it's probably too much. Um, you're gonna get distracted. You're gonna have way too much information that you know what to deal with and go through. Um, you don't want to build something for everyone. You need to have kind of a clear vision on what it is that you're building and stay focused on that, right? Um, and if it's a clear vision you have and people aren't fitting into that vision, well, then you probably need to shift a little bit. Uh, so when I built my most recent project, I built it. Uh, I did these user interviews and I, I have, I think about five or 10 of them. It was just enough for me to get information that I needed in order to build this project. A lot of people will, had this problem, and so it was a key indicator that this would probably be successful. Um, each of my interviews were about 10 to 15 minutes. I know people have done them longer. I know people have done them shorter. You kind of go until you get the information that you need. Uh, if you try to drag it out too long, um, you're going to get extra information that doesn't really pertain to what it is that you're building. So try to stay um pretty focused don't go into many tangents and then if you again if you go too long then people are probably just going to get bored and, and distracted and not really want to be there anymore so try to stay focused try to respect their time um another thing in the validation phase and we're going to kind of jump forward for a second is let's say one day you do want investors right uh that's a good thing to think about you might never need investors. You might not be building a project that requires funding of any level, right? But it's still something that you should think about. Um, and if a investor comes to you and you pitch them your idea, what are some things that they might look for that would uh, get them excited about your project, right? So the biggest thing I think an investor wants to see is promise that your project is going to be successful. And all right, you've done your validation. You've talked to 10 people. And they seem like they have this problem, but that's not enough for them, right? With 
they want to see is that they have you have people following your journey that people are invested in your product even before the MVP is built, right? Uh, and the way you do that is throw up a landing page uh, with an email sign up where you can send these people emails. And if you can get one or two signups on that website, on that landing page, which took you less than a day to build, that's good information, right? It costs $10 to create a landing page now with super easy tools. And if you can't get anyone to sign up on that landing page, that's just only $10 that you spent, right? But if you can get thousands of users or even hundreds of users to sign up on that landing page to follow a journey for a product that hasn't even been started yet, then that's huge. That shows huge progress, right? And we'll get into concepts later about how you can find those users and get those signups. But that's something that people really want to look for. Those investors really are going to look for. Um, who's signing up on this? Is it just friends and family? Because that's great, but you know, they're not, they're not going to move the needle for you once you launch and go to market. When you launch and go to market, you're launching to random strangers that you have to convince to leave Twitter and buy your protein bar off some website that has to get shipped to you or, or install some app uh, and create an account and start moving their stuff into it, right? Um, if you can get random strangers to do that and, and follow your journey and, and stay up to date with whatever this product is, then those investors are going to be really happy with you, right? They they can see that you as a founder is a very strong founder and you're able to convey your vision so clearly to these people, um, to a random stranger where they're going to spend time to sign up for an unbuilt project with zero reputation. That is amazing. And that's what you want to try to do in your validation phase. Um, now, how do you get these signups, right? I kind of mentioned thousands of users, uh, thousands of signups, hundreds of signups. Now that's where, where do those people come from? Um, there's a lot of different ways to get those people, but basically it comes down to go to where they are. We're going to talk a little bit about something called beachhead market in a bit. Um, but basically that's who you are launching to. Uh, when you have your MVP done, you're ready to go to market. The beachhead market is the first people who are going to use your app. So We'll talk a little bit about how to find your beachhead market, but um, you need to, in this part, you need to go to where they are, right? For scuba divers, um, how do you find scuba divers, right? Go to Facebook groups. For me, in my, throughout my research and my, pro, pro, uh, my project, I learned most people, at least what I found, were using Facebook groups to coordinate dives and talk about scuba diving here in Texas. And... And so I went to those groups, right? And that's where I launched it. Um, and if I did my validation phase, which I totally skipped for this specific project, um, I could have gone there and started ask, asking them about uh, about how they are logging dives and if there's any problems and stuff like that. Another place I could have gone to is when you get certified to scuba dive, you have to take a class. I could have gone to those scuba shops and kind of like poked around and talked with the shop owner and seeing maybe I can audit a class or help them out with the class just so I can you know, mention my app and maybe talk about those to those people, right? I could have gone to those people. They're there and they're in my town. Um, and a lot of pro uh, products, maybe it's not so easy, right? Um, maybe you're in the middle of nowhere. Maybe you're in Canada where people don't scuba dive. You still got to talk to those users, right? So I mean, flying to Houston so you can talk to Scuba divers is a little difficult when you're pre MVP phase, but you still need to talk to them. So maybe you can find them online. Um, maybe you can go to markets or, or like I said, the scuba diving classes or conventions. Uh, you still have to find those people and then get them to sign up in your app, right? If you audit a scuba diving class, you mention your product and they like it, then they'll probably sign up. Maybe you put some business cards out, right? Um, another key thing I'm going to touch on this a lot later again is, um, you want to talk to influencers. Influencers are the people who have access, direct access to a lot of people in whatever space you're trying to enter. Right. And they're trusted and people like them. And that's why they have so many followers. And if you can collaborate with them, that's going to be an amazing launch for you. Right. If you get someone even with 500 followers or a thousand followers, 
uh, or is well known on some group somewhere and they mention Dive Sharp, people are going to want to check it out. Oh, this person I really like, I think is cool is using this app. Let me go check it out for myself, right? Versus me who has no reputation in that space mentioning Dive Sharp, and then they're just going to swipe to the next post. So if you can get influencers on board and help you, that'll be amazing. Um, and then in this phase, you also need to set up customer channels uh, and figure out what customer channels are appropriate. And by that, I mean like LinkedIn, Twitter, email, right? So for me, my I am go to a lot of networking events. I'm very involved here in Houston. And so a good ch channel for me is LinkedIn. It's very professional. A lot of people network there. A lot of people discuss what's going on. Uh, so I use that channel a lot professionally. For scuba diving, LinkedIn doesn't really mix, right? So I found Facebook groups work well. Reddit works well. Um, the current project I'm working on, Twitter is a great space for that. So it kind of depends what, um, what product you're working on, and it'll vary differently. This is some research you'll have to do to figure it out. And you want to find that out pre-MVP because you want to start using those channels as you're building your product getting people hyped up, getting people excited. Uh, now I've talked a lot about validation. I'm gonna go into the next slide, MVP, okay? And I have a list up here and you can read it if you really want, but don't read the list yet. The reason I say that is I wanna cover a few things before we get into it. So I mentioned MVP a lot. If you don't know what MVP is, just, it's called minimal viable product. There's a bunch of other names for it, like um, minimal lovable product, minimal desirable product, uh, but all those are just variations trying to describe the same thing better, right? So at the end of the day, MVP is really um, what do you want versus what do your users need? Um, what can you go to market? What is the first thing you're going to put in front of those users, right? When you launch. Uh, now you can have beta users, you can, have, you can test your app out with your friends, your protein bar out with your friends, but at the end of the day, um, your MVP is what you're launching with. So that's kind of what MVP is. Right, so MVP is gonna be very different depending on the market that you're entering, the space that you're entering. I kind of mentioned like Twitter and threads before. When threads launch, their MVP is gonna be very different than my diving app should have been, right? Um, they are going into a space with a lot a, a big competitor, they had to make the perfect product if anyone's ever going to use it, right? It was already a huge challenge. So when they launched to the users and people left Twitter and found bugs and posts weren't saving right and they couldn't search through content the way they wanted to, I was going to be a huge turnoff and they would leave and immediately never go back to it, right? But if you're building a diving app and there's no one big competitor, there's a bunch of small ones, oh, didn't need to do that, then that MVP is going to be need to be more gold plated, right? And and that's why I have this list here, and you can see some things I crossed out, right? Uh, the one thing I love to cross out on every MVP is authentication. Um, authentication is a very tough feature to build out. Um, maybe related to this for the protein bar might be um, uh, the professional protein bar wrapping, right? When you go to the store and you're looking at Cliff, they have very cool wrappers and fun little graphics on them. When Ina launched her protein bar, she she launched in a Ziploc bag at a local market in her town. And people liked it, and it worked. And she didn't have to spend any money on machines that uh, vacuum sealed her food for her, right? And they ate it right there at the market, so the shelf life was another problem she didn't have to worry about. And she was able to buy a box of Ziploc bags for five bucks at Walmart, right? That was her MVP. For me, for my diving app, I built authentication. I built in premium features, which require payment systems. I made it scalable and I made, added social media. These are all very complicated um, features to build out that were launched with bugs that people ended up not liking um, or not needing. You know, I could have launched without authentication. Why, why do people really need to log into my diving app? In fact, if they go to install my app, they spent that time to install my app and they open it up and they're, the first thing they see is a login screen 
people are very reluctant to give any information like that away. And now you have to make the login screen secure. And it's just introducing more and more complexity and more potential bugs to your, your product. Um, I'm going to try to move along a little quicker because we only have 10 minutes left. But those are things you need to see if you can get rid of. I could, if I could have gotten rid of authentication, it would have probably cut a month off of my time to get to market. Same thing with the scalability it was very complex thing I had to learn. I didn't need let let my application be slow and crash, and then I, it's a problem I know I need to solve. That's a good problem to have. If I have too many users using my application, amazing. Um, and I can tell you from my most recent project, I'm building up in this little uh, tiny server that cost me ten dollars a month to to run, and I didn't need any of that scalability and running just fine, right? The social media aspect also launched with a lot of bugs and it wasn't really needed. Let my users request that feature. Um, so your MVP definitely needs a landing page, probably. It definitely probably probably needs a landing page, probably needs a newsletter so you can reach out to your those those users who have uh committed to using your product. Um, and then probably need to access data, create data, and update data, right? So in my case. You just didn't really need to update everything in their dive log. There's probably some stuff that they didn't need to update. Um, I added a way for them to organize their logs into different log books, different folders. It was very nice, but at the end of the day, they could have just created a log. I didn't need all of that. Um, and then I could have taken all of those things that I really wanted to build and put them into a post launch fast, fast follows where once I had the time to focus on those and I could have, right? I could have pushed them to just post launch uh, and it would have been okay. I thought people would have seen my product and been like, nah, this isn't fully featured. I don't want to use it. But for my case, it would have been okay. So those are some things you definitely need to think about. Um, I'm going to touch on the social media aspect just slightly a little bit. Um, so I'm working on this new project currently and I, so I have the social media aspect. It's not like adding friends or anything like that, but it's creating a shareable link that you can create content, get a URL and send it to your friends where they can also see that stuff. I did ask around a little bit before I built this and people seemed like they wanted it. And then when I launched that feature, I spent time to build it and I launched it. No one actually ended up using it. Now, it was sort of a risk I thought of and I figured, you know, this is okay. If they don't use it, it's not that big of a deal. It wasn't such a huge feature. It didn't take that much time. But if someone shared the URL, it would have been fantastic because everyone they shared to a, the URL with would have clicked it and it would have opened my app and or the website and uh, introduced them to my product. It would have been driving new traffic that I don't have access to to my application. Um, and it was simple enough that I thought it was worth building. So uh, you can kind of play around with the features and see if it's really worth doing all of that information, uh, doing all of that. Now, the slimmer you can get your product, the better, you know, introducing less bugs, less potential bugs. Um, then it's also when you're doing authentication and collecting information, uh, are you collecting publicly identifiable information? Is it sensitive? And are you compliant in every single country that you're launching to? These things get really kind of scary kind of fast. And these are things you need to worry about Otherwise, you can get yourself into some trouble. So think about those concepts when you're you're building your project. And if you can remove some of those worries, that's amazing. Um, and you're not spending time creating potential features that people don't want, right? Another thing to think about with your MVP, it doesn't have to be absolutely 100% amazing. It doesn't have to look good and doesn't need great UI. You can tweak all those things later and be okay with that. Right. You're going to be very nervous launching your app and no one's going to want to use it. But then, you, you know, if they don't use it, they probably wouldn't have used it if it was gold plated and had every single feature that they ever wanted. Um, if they're, they can, if you can convey your vision and your solution to them so clearly, uh, when they use your app, they'll see those features are down the line, right? If you they open that app and they have this actual problem that you're solving, and they'll see that the app is slim and that you're building those things out still, right? Um, if you're 
set up those good customer channels, you can convey those messages to them very well, right? And and so uh, those are some things to think about for your MVP. Um, another thing I want to talk about is getting to market. It's going to be a very quick slide. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. You want to get to market as fast as possible. Don't waste time building all these extra things out, right? Get to market as fast as possible and let your users tell you what they want. Don't make all these assumptions of what others want and what people want. Get to market and let them tell you. Um, you're going to want to launch to your friends, your family, Facebook groups, Reddit, Twitter. Um, that's what, once you have your MVP, that's what that looks like, right? Getting it into the hands of users. Um, for Ina, for her protein bar, it was going to markets and giving it to them, right? Uh, eventually, you know, she started upgrading her equipment, getting better uh, equipment so she can make more protein bars faster and look more professional. And then she was able to improve the shelf life and then get it into grocery stores. And, uh, and that was huge for her, but she did that very slowly over a long period of time. You know, and she slowly improved and she learned the market. She learned the space and was able to get to that point. Uh, the next slide I want to talk about is getting your users, right? Uh, I know we only have four minutes left, so I'm going to try to go really fast. Um, I've talked about ads. You know, if I come across an ad on Twitter, uh, you need to, you're, I'm basically trying to convince people to leave the platform and open your app and install it, right? But if I see an influencer post my post about some app that I follow, right? I'm more likely to spend the time to go purchase that protein bar or install that app. So ads are great, but they're expensive. Influencers don't are hard to connect with, um, but they're more promising, I personally think. Um, and then you can do things where you collaborate with these influencers, you know, do competitions, do collaborations, um, do trip some something I like to talk about is trivia. You maybe they're uh, going to post some trivia about the space you're entering, and then the winner gets free premium to your product for a year, right? Now, they've talked about it, they've engaged with their users about it, and they've gotten your name out. Um, and then you got to give them something in return. Maybe you can give them premium for life or something like that. But if they help you out, you have to help them out. Um, not everyone needs payment, but a lot probably do. So getting to work with them is going to be very difficult. Um, there's other spaces you can launch to, right? Like product hunt and build in public. I think those are great and definitely should launch them, but you can really only do that once. And necessarily not necessarily, the people on in those spaces aren't necessarily your target customer, right? You want to launch to your beachhead market. Uh, I think I skipped some information about beachhead market that I want to cover, but definitely look that up. Um, and People on Product Hunt and Build in Public on Twitter, they're going to be more startup-y, entrepreneurial kind of people, but not all of them are going to be scuba divers. So if I launch them, they might have good feedback. It might be very critical, which is helpful, but they're not going to really move the needle for me. Um, make sure you set up your customer channels, get those working really well, like social medias, newsletters, ads, whatever it is, get those going and be consistent with them. Uh, I recommend Twitter ads for a lot of products. It won't work for everything, but what's nice about those, I've used a few other platforms, but Twitter ads lets you be so granular so easily. You can find influencers, right? Someone with a lot of following in your space and you can target them. You can target their followers. You can even filter it down to people that mention certain words or have certain interests. It's really scary what you can do with Twitter ads actually, but um, when I used it, it was very successful and it wasn't too expensive. So, um, again, it costs money. And if you can have some kind of natural virality, that's free, that's even better. And that really showed more promise for your product. Uh, if you have to pay for every single customer, that's not great. So, uh, those are some things to consider. Um, but yeah, natural virality, I kind of mentioned that briefly, but that's the best way to know if your product is worth it. Uh, I know we're just about at time, so I'm going to end it here. If you have any questions, uh, and you didn't get to ask them in this video uh, or this 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 uh, this thing, definitely reach out to me on Twitter. Um, some resources I'm going to recommend real quick. These are some books I love. The Mom Test is about talking to users. This link down here is about how to talk to users. We kind of covered that re briefly. Building a Lean Startup, 
Peter Thiel's zero to one is great book. The cold start problem that goes into how you can uh, build a product that requires content like Facebook. You need users to create content, you need content for users. And then he talks a little bit about that. Hooked is about how to get users back into your app, how to keep them using it, stuff like that. Um, over here, if you need beta users and you can't find them, you can use these websites. Uh, definitely better to try to find beta users outside of this, but uh, this is helpful. I think all of these are paid. I'm not sure how expensive they are. That's something to think about. Um, and then talking with your users, I mentioned that Y Combinator has a great courses on that. Um, this title is actually wrong. Uh, this is one of these is for the business model campus and the other is the empathy map campus. I mentioned those in the validation phase part of this presentation. Great, 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 great resources. And everyone with any idea should definitely look at those resources, watch on YouTube's videos. They take 10 minutes, an hour, a couple hours. If you really want to do it really good, you can spend more time on it or you can do it really quickly. But they have saved me so much time and helped me think about a lot of things that I didn't think about when I was visualizing, visualizing my my startups and my, my projects and stuff like that uh, and understanding my users. So I know we had one comment um, by Mike. Uh, yeah, I need... we... He was responding to your, how do you, how do you schedule when you have so uh -oh. many projects? And Perfect. he said, I need to consider the opportunity cost and decide if I prefer to do one thing or the other. In the end, we need some compromise on something to make time for another. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's really kind of what I was getting at is you need to compromise. And actually, even one project, you're with a lot of features, you have to compromise, right? You can't just build everything. You can't do everything. So you're going to, as a founder, especially if it's a solo founder, you're going to have so much that you have to do. Marketing, logos, customer relationships, customer service, setting up email systems, and all of this stuff that's not easy to do. You're going to do everything. So compromising is really a big part of it. Well, that's for, all I got. I'm for myself, I was going to answer this as well. Uh, for myself, I'm, I'm a hobby farmer. So for me, it's like a moving priority list. And it's just we have to get things done at uh, a particular time or in a particular order. So, so it's as we work on things, we get it done and according to the priority list. So X comes before Y before, comes before Z. Every once in a while, we will have a shift in that priority list. For example, we have a problem with one of the hoop coops is falling apart or something like that. Well, that now suddenly becomes high pri highest priority. The other pro work pauses until we get that task done. But it really is about making sure we get tasks done rather than in the middle of 20. <laughs> right. I think that's great, great example. Um, and it doesn't mean you can't do all the other stuff. It's just going to get pushed down a little bit down the road. And you got to be okay with that. It's uncomfortable sometimes, but that's all right. Well, well, that's all I got. Um, I know I don't know when the next improving talk is scheduled for. I yeah, I was about to say that we're definitely taking a break for the holidays. Yeah. Um, we don't have any until next year for sure. Uh, as for when it starts back up next year, I'm also not sure. It may be the third. <laughs> it may be the tenth. Yeah, uh, we're still working that out, but I'm relatively. 99% sure we're going to continue with improving talks into 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, make sure you check out our website. And if, again, if you have any questions, reach out. I'm definitely happy to uh, kind of chat and yeah, talk. Well, all right. Well, that's that's everything. Thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Let's put the link to the webinars so people can keep a lookout for whenever we post the next one. Awesome. Alrighty, hope you all enjoyed the talk and we will see you all next time.